Hi, this lesson is about the transformation of, of functions. So that means we're going to be sh shifting them either vertically or horizontally, or we're going to be shrinking or expanding them um, in some way. So we first we talk about vertical and horizontal shifts. So suppose we have a constant, and I'm calling my constant k, that is added to a function. Um, and when I say added, like added outside of the function, so if I have f of x plus k, that's going to shift my function k units up. So the whole graph will go up by k units. Um, if I subtract k from f of x, that will shift the graph vertically k units down. Then with horizontal shifts, it's a little bit different. The k is going to affect the x and then you apply the function. So if you add k units to x and then take the function of that, of x plus k, that's going to shift k units left. So when I'm adding, I'm going to the left. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think it would be. Um, and when you are subtracting k units from x and then applying the function, then that means you're going to shift k units to the right. So here are a few examples of, of those shifts. So if my function is f of, uh, f of x equal to x squared or y equals to x squared, shifting it three units up would mean that I would add three to x squared. That's exactly what was described here. So the graphs would look like this. The original graph is here in blue with the vertex at zero, zero. But when the whole thing shifts up by three units, my vertex is now here at zero three. So the whole graph looks exactly the same, except it's just shifted three units upward, which means all of the y values shift by three units, including the vertex. Um, in the next example, it says to state the function that'll shift y equals x squared three units to the right. Well, that's when I have to apply this last part right here. So if I'm shifting x squared three units to the right, that means I have to subtract three from x and then square it. So it definitely looks different than this one. It's a different kind of shift. This is my original function with the vertex at zero, zero. But when I shift three units to the right, my vertex is now at three, zero. But the rest of the graph should look exactly the same. So all of the x values shift over or um, you add three uh, units to the x value, including the vertex. So that's why zero, zero becomes three, zero. Okay. So in this next question, um, it's asking what type of shift would occur to the graph of y equals x squared in the graph of uh, y equal to x plus one to the second power minus four. So this one will have both the vertical and the horizontal shift. So the x plus one to the second, that's like this. It's going to be a one unit left. And then the minus four is like this part here. And so that's gonna be four units down. So when you describe that, it shifts y equals x squared one unit to the left and four units down. So again, if this is the original graph, this is what the new graph would look like. I would have a vertex at negative one, negative four. So zero, zero, we went from zero, zero being the vertex to negative one, negative four, because we shifted one unit left and four units down. And I, and I focus on the vertex because that's one really important point that you always want to show on a parabola because where it's where it's either going to be the lowest value, also called the minimum, or if it's an upside down parabola, your vertex is going to be the maximum value, just to uh, remind you of some vocabulary from previous lessons. Okay, what type of shift would occur, this is example four, to the graph of y equal to the square root of x in the graph of y equal to the square root of x minus two? This is definitely going to be a horizontal shift because the, the minus two is inside of the function, which is the square root. So, um, 
and then you're asked to state the domain. So uh, this is going to be a shift to the right. So just to remind you, when you're subtracting from the x value, you're shifting to the right. So this is going to be a horizontal shift, two units to the right. Go back to it. Um, so it's two units to the right. And the domain of this function is from 2 to infinity because anything less than 2 would result in a negative number inside of here. So just to remind you, the domain of this function, square root of x, is from 0 to infinity. So when I'm shifting to the right, it's also shifting your domain to, uh, by 2 units. So now it's the domain is from 2 to infinity. And that's what the graph would look like right here. The original parent graph starts at 0, 0 and looks has the same shape. Um, so this is just the horizontal shift by two units. So again, going back to those parent graphs um, that were taught in an earlier lesson, is important that you know those parent graphs well so that when we do shifting, um, they look familiar to you. Okay, so what type of shift would occur to the uh, graph of the function y equal to the absolute value of x in the graph of y equal to the absolute value of x plus 3 plus 2. This is both a vertical and a horizontal shift. Anything that's going on inside of the function, and in this case its absolute value is going to be horizontal, so this is going to go left by 3 units, and it's going to go up by 2 units. So that's what they mean by uh, describing it or what is is the shift. It's going to go three units left and two units up. So the graph looks of an absolute value function looks like a V. So the absolute value of X is just a V with the, uh, the, the, the middle at the origin. But when I shift three units left and two units up, the corner is at negative three, positive two. Okay, here you're asked to state the function. So state the function that would shift y equal to x cubed one unit, uh, one unit to the left. So that means it's going to affect the x and then you're going to cube it. When you go left, that means you need to add the 1. So that's going to be x plus 1 to the third power. Then I asked you to state the domain. This is a polynomial function. If I were to expand this, this would be a third degree polynomial. And remember, polynomial functions always have um, uh, a domain of all real numbers. So that's why there are no restrictions there. So again, we learned domain and range in an earlier lesson. If, if you need a refresher, you need to go back to earlier lessons in chapter two. Um, number seven, example seven, asks you to state the function that would shift y equal to 1 over x. Remember, this is also one of the parent graphs. This is called a reciprocal function. And we're going to shift that two units to the right and three units down. So right means that I have to affect the x exactly where it is. So right means I have to subtract 2 from x. But then the vertical ones, in this case down, three units down, down is outside of that reciprocal function, so you put the minus 3 um, after that. So it's 1 over x minus 2 with the x minus 2 in the denominator, minus 3. Rational functions like the reciprocal function is often have restrictions to the domain. Remember, you cannot have any value of x in the domain that results in division by 0, so that will be when x is 2. So your domain is all real numbers except for 2. So with interval notation, it's written as negative infinity to 2 with a parenthesis around the 2, union 2 to infinity. We also have reflections. A reflection of a graph will be a reflection across the x-axis or a reflection across the y-axis. And it really just means that the graph will look the same on either side of the axes depending on the reflection. So you're going to think of the x-axis as a mirror when it's a reflection across the x-axis and uh, you can think of the y-axis as the mirror 
uh, when it's a reflection across uh, the y-axis. So if y, the graph of y equal to negative f of x will reflect the original graph y equal to f of x across the x-axis. In other words, it's going to flip it downward. So if the original graph looks like this, this is y equals f of x, then y equal to negative f of x would look like that. It would just be a reflection across the x-axis. Um, but then the opposite is true with a reflection across the y-axis. That's when the negative is impacting um, the, the x directly. So y equal to f of negative x is a reflection of the graph y equals f of x across the y-axis. So again, this is um, a reflection across x across the x-axis. Then the next picture, if this is the original function, y equals f of x. And if I said reflection across the y-axis, it would be here. This would be y equal to f of negative x. So this is a reflection across the y-axis. Okay. So here's a picture, another picture. Um, if I have f of x equal to x squared, again, that's your quadratic, your, your parabola, your parent function. The graph of g of x equal to negative x squared, well, that's going to be this first scenario here. It's a reflection across the x-axis. The negative is in front of the fact function. So this is what the two pictures would look like. f of x is the one in purple, g of x is the one in orange, and they do share a common point, which is the vertex at 0, 0. Now, if I did a reflection across the y-axis, here's my example. If f of x is the square root function, um, and if I said, uh, you know, what's the graph of g of x, uh, which is the square root of negative x, this means that the x is now impacted by that negative, which means that my reflection is across the y-axis. So here's the graph of f of x in this, uh, like a reddish pink color. And then uh, g of x, which is the reflection, is in blue. And again, they share a common point at the origin at 0, 0. Um, and because they're both square root functions, they definitely do have restrictions on the domain. The domain of f of x is all positive numbers, including 0. So that's how you would get a real number result in here. But then with g of x, uh, the domain is from negative infinity to 0. Because when you plug in a negative number, the opposite sign of a negative number becomes positive, And so that's how you would get a real number result. And that's why g of x is in quadrant 2, because um, my domain is negative numbers, uh, including 0. OK, so this was g. So now we're going to talk about symmetry. And there is more than one type of symmetry. We're only going to discuss even and odd symmetry. So um, a function is considered to be even, um, which means symmetric about the y-axis, um, if f of x equals f of negative x. So something like the square root function, I'm sorry, the uh, parabola is, um, is considered to be even because the right side, quadrant 1, and quadrant two are mirror images of each other. So this is not a reflection. This is one single function where the left side and the right side of the graph look the same. And the way that's proven is by evaluating that expression. If f of x equals negative, uh, sorry, f of negative x, if f of x equals f of negative x, then you can say that the graph uh, of the function is even. Um, an odd function occurs when it is symmetric about the origin. 
And something that's symmetric about the origin would be something like, like the line y equals x. This is symmetric about the origin because if you think about the origin as like your pivot, if I were to ab able to reflect quadrant one into quadrant three, all the points in quadrant one would lie right on top of quadrant three and vice versa. Um, so that's what it means to be symmetric about the origin. And that's the way you would prove it, either by proving that these two equations are true or proving that these two equations are true. They're really the same. Um, I tend to use the second one more, but they both work um, if you're asked to prove if something is odd. Not all functions are even or odd. Some are don't have any symmetry at all. Um, so here we want to show that f of x equal to 1 minus x to the fourth is even. So the graph is immediately to the right. So it certainly looks like it would be even. It looks like the left side and the right side of the graph um, are the same um, across the y-axis. But now to prove it, I have to set up this equation. So this is the f of x part, and this is the f of negative x part. Um, so the right side is right here. But this is a negative 1 to the 4th power, which negative 1 to the 4th power is a positive 1. So the left side and the right side are equal, and therefore it is even. If a function is even, it cannot be odd. Um, you can have an equation that's both even and odd, but it wouldn't be a function. And the example of that would be a circle with an, um, a center at the origin. Um, so this is the center. So this would be symmetric across the x-axis. So the left side at the top and the bottom of the circle would be the same. And it's also symmetric across the y-axis. In other words, the right side and the left side of the circle would be the same. But this is not a function. And the reason why it's not a function is because it fails the vertical line test, which is again something that we talked about um, in earlier lessons. Okay, so for example 11, we want to show that g of x equal to x to the fifth plus x is odd. That means I need to solve um, either this equation or this one. So I used the first one. I usually use the second one, but I want to show you how either one works. So I replace all the x's with negative x on the left side, and then I put a minus in front of the function on the right side. Then I simplify both sides. This is negative 1 to the fifth power, so that's going to give me negative x to the fifth, plus negative x gives me minus x on the left. And here, when I distribute this negative, I'll get the same thing, negative x to the fifth minus x. Since both sides are equal, we can say that it is odd. And the graph looks like this. This is what the graph of x to the fifth plus x looks like. It definitely looks like quadrant one, if I were to flip that across the origin, would lie right on top of quadrant three and vice versa. If I were to flip quadrant three across the origin, it would lie on, right on top of quadrant one. And that's what it means to be uh, an odd symmetry, an odd function. It's symmetric about the origin. Okay, so here you're asked to determine if h of x equal to 3x to the fourth plus 4x squared is even or odd symmetric or if it is not symmetric at all. So first I'm going to check if it's even. And so with even, I need to check this equation. Is f of x equal to f of negative x? So here's the f of x part, and here's the f of negative x part. So replace all the x's with negative x. The left side is not going to change, but the right side, um, this becomes negative 3x cubed plus 4x squared. So they are not equal. This first term uh, is different by a sign. So therefore, it is definitely not even. So now we have to check if it's odd. So if it's odd, I'm going to check is f of x equal to negative f of negative x. 
So again, the left side doesn't change. You just copy down the original function. And the right side, you put a negative in front and replace all the x's with negative x. We just did the inside part here when we checked for even. And so we know that that's going to equal negative 3x cubed plus 4x squared, but that minus is still in front. When you distribute it, you get on the right side, 3x to the third minus 4x squared. This time, the second term is off by a sign, so uh, they are not equal on both sides. And so, therefore, it is neither even nor odd, so uh, h of x is not symmetric about either of the two x, uh, um, about the y-axis or about the origin. And the picture looks like this. You can see that it's not symmetric around the y-axis. The right side does not look like the left side of the graph, and it is not symmetric about the origin. If you were to flip quadrant one down into quadrant three, um, it would not lie right on top of what you see in quadrants two and three. So the picture also demonstrates that we don't have symmetry here. Um, and just to remind you, this uh, function h of x is a polynomial. And like I mentioned earlier in the lesson and in earlier lessons to this one, the domain of a polynomial function is all real numbers. And if you look at the graph, the left side goes to negative infinity and the right side goes to infinity. So the range is also all real numbers. Okay, so now we go on to a different part of the lesson, and this second part, or I guess third part, is about stretching and shrinking of graphs. So that means we're going to be multiplying by a constant, not adding and subtracting them uh, the way I did with vertical and horizontal shifts. This time we're going to have a constant either being multiplied in front of the function, or it's going to multiply uh, the independent variable, which we usually call x. So here, if y equals to c times f of x, where c is a real number, and c is greater than 1, then the graph of y equal to f of x is stretched vertically. So in other words, it's going to get skinnier. Um, when c is between 0 and 1, so... That could be something like a half, or it could be a decimal, like 0 0.3. So if it's a number between 0 and 1, the graph of y equal to f of x is um, shrinking vertically. So it shrank vertically. Um, so how does that look like? So here are three... Um, pictures. So y equal to x squared is in the middle. That's the one in red. Three, y equal to 3x squared is, um, is the one in blue. And so you can see that it's like squeezing it. It's the x squared, the one in red is getting squeezed. Um, and then my y equal to 1 half x squared, well, that looks like it was kind of pulled away, but it's shrinking vertically because like at any single value, like if here, when I'm at this value of x here, that's x equal to 2, my y value is um, lower when I'm at uh, on the green one where my coefficient is x squared. So that's why they're saying it shrank vertically because the y values are getting um are getting smaller, but I'm, when I'm on the blue one, two, I don't even see it on the graph, is way up here somewhere. So that's getting stretched. So although it looks like it's skinnier uh, from a, the perspective of, from a vertical perspective, the y values are bigger in this one than they were in this one. So again, it's just a matter of remembering if the number is greater than 1 versus between 0 and 1, what the behavior is. Um, you can always plug in numbers to help you think it through. So here we say, just to describe the following transformation of y equal to 
uh, f of x. So I have y equals 4 f of x plus 5. So this one is going to um, um, uh, squeeze it the way we did in the, in the previous one, and it's also shifting uh, your graph because the 5 is outside of whatever's going on with the function. So for part A, it's a stretch vertically by a factor of 4, and it's a vertical shift up by 5 units. Part B is also um, a coefficient being multiplied by your function, and this is a number between 0 and 1. Um, so this is going to shrink it vertically, and this is going to be a horizontal shift um, to the right. When you subtract from x, it's shifting it to the right. So it is a shrink vertically by a factor of 0.25, and it's a horizontal shift uh, to the right by 3 units. And then part C, I'm including um, a stretch, a horizontal, this is a stretch, this is a horizontal shift, this is a vertical shift, but I also have a negative in front of the whole thing, which means it's going to be a reflection as well. So it's pretty much everything we've talked about today. So part C is a reflection across the x-axis because of the negative in front. Um, it's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2 because of the 2 in front of f of x. And it is a horizontal shift, one unit to the left because of the plus 1. And it is a vertical shift, uh, uh, four units down. So at the end of the lesson, I have a table just to uh, keep all this information organized, whether it's a shift or a horizontal, vertical, a stretch, or a shrink. Um, so that comes up later on. Now we're going to talk about horizontal stretching and shrinking. So that means from a horizontal perspective, we're going to figure out, is it stretching or shrinking? Um, so... This time, our coefficient is going to affect the x. So if y equals f of c times x, so that's different than what we did before. Here, the coefficients were in front of f of x. This time, the coefficient is in front of the independent variable. Um, so if c is greater than 1, then it's going to shrink horizontally. So in other words, from a horizontal perspective, it's getting squeezed. And it's, it's shrinking by a factor of 1 over C. So this is different than all the other ones we did. It's going to be shrink by the reciprocal of whatever that number is, as long as C is greater than 1. Um, if your C is between 0 and 1, and again, that means um, it could be a fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1, then the graph of f of x stretches horizontally. So it's going to spread out from a horizontal perspective, but again, by a factor of 1 over c. So if c is a third, then the factor would be uh, 1 over a third, so that would equal 3. So it's always going to be the reciprocal of whatever your constant is when your constant is affecting the x directly. So if y equals x to the third minus x, um, we want to sketch the graph of y equal to 3x to the third minus 3x. So in other words, my factor is 3. Um, I'm sorry, my factor is going to be 1 over 3 because um, my constant is 3. So... Here's the original function in red, y equals x cubed minus x. And the one I just um, mentioned is the one here in blue. So this is going to, um, this is going to uh, shrink it horizontally. So from a horizontal perspective, imagine taking this red graph and shrinking it down to get this blue graph. So it's stretching vertically, but horizontally it's getting squeezed. Um, so that's the one in blue. And then the other graph is this one. This one is, is going to um, uh, 
it's going to stretch by a factor of 5 because my C is 1 fifth. So it's going to stretch by a factor of 5, which means it's, it's expanding horizontally. So that is the one here in green. So you can use a graphing calculator or um, uh, an app called Desmos, which will allow you to just kind of plug in uh, graphs and you can see them all on the same grid the way I did here. I actually used Desmos to craft these. I just entered three different graphs with these factors so that I can compare them all on the same space and you can see which one is uh, stretching and which one is shrinking from a horizontal perspective. Okay, so here, given that f of x is equal to the square root of x, describe the following transformations. So I have y equal to uh, the square root of 2x, then I have y equal to the square root of 1 third x, um, and then I have y equal to 3 square root of 5x minus 1. So there's different things going on uh, with these. The first two are just using the, this topic that I just talked about, and then the third one is a combination of different transformations we talked about. So for the first one, um, we're multiplying the x by 2, so that's going to shrink the entire square root function by a factor of a half. Remember, you take the reciprocal of that number. The part B is very similar, but um, but the number is a third, which is a number between 0 and 1. And so that's going to stretch by a factor of 3. So the reciprocal of a third is, is, um, is 3. So that's going to stretch it out horizontally by a factor of 3. And then the, the third one is a combination. So the 3 in front of the radical is going to stretch it vertically by a factor of 3. The 5 in front of the x is going to shrink it horizontally by a factor of a fifth. And the minus 1, which is outside of the function, outside of the square root, is going to shift it down by one unit. Okay, state the function g of x that transforms f of x equal to x to the third by stretching it horizontally by a factor of four. So this time um, we have to come up with what the function is that will stretch it horizontally by a factor of four. So when you're stretching horizontally, that means that I have to multiply by a number that is between 0 and 1. And if my factor is 4, then it's going to be the reciprocal of that. So g of x is 1 fourth of x raised to the third power. And if you actually um, cube this, it's 1 over 64 x to the third. Okay, here we're going to graph so that you can see these transformations. My original function is, again, my square root function. And um, we want to show the graph of y equal to negative 3 root x. So again, this is a couple of different transformations. I have a negative in front, which means it's a reflection, and then the 3 in front of the root x. So square root of x looks like the one in blue. And then um, y equal to negative 3 root x. Um, so if you're doing this by hand, I didn't uh, use an app for this. I just plugged in some numbers in here and plugged in the values of x into this function so that you can see what it looks like. Remember, the domain is from 0 to infinity, so I plugged in 0, and then I plugged in a few numbers that I could easily take the square root of, so 1, 4, and 9, multiplied them by negative 3. And so this looks like it is a, a reflection across the x-axis, and it is also a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. And so the graph of negative 3 root x is the one in orange. So here's a summary of all of our transformation rules. So for studying purposes, this will help you out. Um, the top part or the top table is are your vertical and horizontal shifts. Um, 
So if you're adding a constant to f of x, you are shifting up. If you're subtracting a constant, you're shifting down. If you're subtracting a constant from the value of x, you're shifting to the right. And if you're adding a constant to the independent variable x, you are shifting to the left. And then uh, there are examples in the last column here. So this is um, a good table to have when you're studying these principles and these will come up throughout the semester in almost every single chapter. It's not just a chapter two concept. We'll use it in chapter three and chapter four as well, all these shifting principles. Then we have non-rigid transformations, and those are the ones when you're multiplying um, by a, a number. So I'm using a as my number. So if you have a times f of x and a is greater than 1, then that's going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of a. If you're multiplying by a but a is between 0 and 1, that's going to be a vertical compression or um, a shrink uh, vertically by a factor of a. If you are multiplying your independent variable by a and a is greater than 1, um, then that's going to be a horizontal compression, um, meaning it's getting squeezed by a factor of 1 over a. And if you are multiplying by a, or a, x is being multiplied by a, and a is between 0 and 1, that's going to be a horizontal expansion. So it's getting um, pulled horizontally uh, to the left and right. So it's expanding, again, by a factor of 1 over a. So the non-rigid ones are, I think, the more challenging ones to remember, but they also don't come up as often as the vertical and horizontal ones in future lessons. So again, for studying purposes, these tables are helpful. Um, and then we had reflections. So a reflection across the x-axis is when you have a negative in front of your function, a reflection across the y-axis is when you have a negative in front of the independent variable. Um, so, and those we used a few times today. All right, so that's it for this lesson. Good luck.